This is like, like, am I, I? Very friendly. Very friendly. And now the plant's in her face again. Gail. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our final. A dramatic beginning. No. just gone to the bathroom. <laughs> The signaling again. Good evening, everyone. Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the final in our series of webinars hosted by the BHTA Public Relations Committee. And this evening, I am so very excited and pleased to welcome our panelists, Dr. Kerry Hall on my left and Professor Henry Fraser on my right, Pro Professor Sir, Sir Henry, Henry Fraser, oh, okay. correct, on my right. Um, I want to give a little bit of an explanation as to how we got to the point where I have these two esteemed persons sitting next to me. Um, a few months ago, we were at the University of the West Indies making a donation of this book, Island in the Sun, and I'm so pleased to have former chairperson of the BHTA, Pat Patricia Afonso Das, who during her tenure was one of the persons who worked on this project to bring the history of tourism alive via this book. And we were making a donation of these books for students who obviously are studying tourism who may have an interest in understanding the evolution of the industry. And as a part of that discussion, um, and as part of that presentation, both uh, Dr. Hall and Professor Emeritus Sir Henry Fraser were there. And they were sharing with us the process of creating this book and how much information they had to leave out of it, how much had to be left on the cutting floor. Because if you know Dr. Hall, she's extremely passionate about anything that she does. And at that time, she was trying to condense her knowledge and the history of tourism into enough pages that could actually hold on top of a table. And that job, that task, was given to Professor Fraser. Mm -hmm. Professor Fraser, can I just call you Professor Fraser for the rest? That's fine. Great. Henry. Um, and between the two of them, they collaborated and managed to come up with what is really a fantastic document and record of the evolution of tourism on the island. So I asked them as a part of that process, and, it, and because it's our 70th year of existence as the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, to be a part of a discussion to help you to understand where we came from in terms of tourism, the history of this island in relation to tourism, and to lend, to shed some light on the information that would have guided them to the place where they created this book. So I want to take a minute just to take you through the bios of these two distinguished Barbadians. Dr. Hall is a double graduate of the University of the West Indies in Barbados with a bachelor's in management and a PhD in 
tourism history. She also holds a master's in hotel and food service management from the Florida International University School of Hospitality Management. And her professional experience spans both public and private sectors across the Caribbean. She's held posts including Chief Tourism Development Officer in the Ministry of Tourism. She's been a trade consultant for Tourism Entertainment Services at the Barbados Private Sector Trade Team. She's been Director of People Development and Training at the prestigious Five Diamond Sandy Lane Hotel. And she's also worked as an independent consultant, consultant on local and regional tourism projects. And she's given presentations on a range of tourism-related topics across the region, from St. Lucia and St. Kitts to as far afield as Mexico and Nigeria. Um, she's served as the Chief Executive Officer of our Barbados Tourism Product Authority, and subsequently as Director of Tourism Development in the Ministry of Tourism and International Transport, where she advised the Minister on a number of sectoral concerns. Dr. Hall is, again, an independent consultant, undertaking various tourism projects, and I can speak to the, one of the most recent ones, her Tourism Overhaul Program. If you have not seen it, please do go online and subscribe and watch. Very interesting journey across tourism in Barbados and the region. Um, one of her most notable projects was crafting the white paper on the development of tourism in Barbados from 2012 to 2022 for the Barbados government. And she's still, in my, and in my opinion, this is still our most seminal work related to the vision for the industry. Her passion continues to be assisting in the development of a sustainable and responsible tourism industry, and one that exceeds the expectations of our guests while simultaneously making a positive difference to the lives of the Barbadian people. And she's really passionate about ensuring that our sector realizes its true potential, being a catalyst for social, environmental, and economic transformation that benefits all. And I don't know how I'm going to condense this bio because <laughs> Sir, Professor Sir Henry Fraser, <laughs> Professor Emeritus Sir Henry Fraser, is frankly pretty amazing. Um, he was born in the most beautiful parish on the island. I, I leave no doubt as to St. John. Obviously. For those of you in doubt, he entered the Lodge <laughs> School the at the age of, of St. eight, <laughs> where he won a Barbados scholarship in 1962 and proceeded to the University of the West Indies in Jamaica to study medicine. And from there, he was selected for a Bachelor of Science in Physiology at the University College of London. And then he completed his studies and came back to UE. He's told me to make this as brief as possible. I will try. But some of this stuff is so tantalizing. <laughs> um, he returned home after completing his PhD in 1977 as a lecturer in medicine at University of the West Indies. And he went on to establish a clinical pharmacology laboratory and drug monitoring service at the hospital, which was the first in the region. He's done many other things, including establishing the Chronic Disease Research Center in 1992 and serving as director of that institute until 2005, when he was appointed dean of the School of Clinical Medicine and Research. Oh, sorry, that was in 2001. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, he has had alternative careers in art, architectural history, heritage, preser heritage preservation, tourism, and public speaking. He served as president of the Barbados National Trust, and I know he's going to talk about his passion for heritage tourism as a part of his discussion today, and in a number of other roles. Um, he's published some 15 books, including on architecture and heritage for the University of the West Indies Press, Macmillan and Miller Publishing, including Island in the Sun, the story of tourism in Barbados, and the new historic churches of Barbados, some 450 newspaper columns. <laughs> And he's worked on a number of other projects across the island. Um, this is the most important thing, I'm sure, to him. He's married to Dr. Maureen Skeet Fraser, and he has one son, Robert, and three wonderful grandchildren. Um, he's received many awards throughout his life, and certainly, as they have honored him, it is truly our honor to be able to welcome you Thank here you. today. Thank you. And having done that momentous task, I am now going to turn to our panelists and ask them, please, um, you owe me a document, ma'am. Well, this? <laughs> yes, that. I'm, I'm going to give it to you when I'm finished. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so Kerry is, is really someone I love to have on my panels because she's always so passionate about what she's doing. And her process is to make me nervous about whether or not I'm going to cover everything that she needs to say in her presentation. Um, Kerry, we talked about where we started. We talked about the fact that I personally wanted to hear some of the information that you left on the cutting floor in creating this book and to understand the history of tourism because it is a passion of myself and I think everyone who's here in person in this room and probably a lot of persons who are listening in online. So can you take us through 
from any point that you wish to start, an understanding of how tourism evolved in Barbados Ooh. to present. And I want to use to help us to parallel where we've come from to where we are now and where we are going. OK, you want me to do that in 20 minutes? 20 minutes. <laughs> the clock starts now. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's going to be very difficult. I understand. Um, extremely difficult. And I may have to leave some of the stuff on the cutting room floor to be taken up in the uh, questions and, and answer. The wondrous thing about this global phenomenon called tourism is that I believe that the major, majority of people in Barbados and beyond probably thought tourism began with the inception of the Board of Tourism in the late 1950s. And I also thought that for many, many years until I went and did this study on tourism. And, and it was almost accidental because I really was looking at um, uh, the trajectory of tourism over 100 years when I was doing my PhD. And the historical part was supposed to be in the first chapter. Only when I started to dig and peel back the layers and started to come up with information that was just sitting there on shelves for years, sometimes hundreds of years. And I started to read it and realize, oh my god, what is happening here is actually tourism. Even though the word tourism did not make its uh, first appearance in the Oxford Dictionary to the, word, to the year 1811, what was happening in Barbados in the 1700s, the 1800s, um, the early 1900s, was actually a, a, a touristic type of, of, of experience on the island, even before the word was, 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 was invented, as I said. So that, <coughs> I shifted what I was doing then to completely focus on that early er, um, time span <coughs> of tourism. When I did the, the study, and it was called Beyond the Plantations, the Barbados Tourism Industry, 1790 to 1914, I realized that there were really three phases of, of tourism in Barbados. There was the phase from the 1700s to the First World War, 1914. The interwar phase from 1918 to 1939. And then the third phase, which was the post-World War phase. And what they all held in common is that as tourism was growing and it was evolving over that time period, every time there was a global crisis in the world, it brought tourism to a screeching halt. So if I'm using that as a benchmark, I positively view that we're now entering the fourth phase of tourism in a post-COVID environment. Um, because there was a global phenomenon, a global crisis that brought tourism to a screeching halt. And we, we can't go back the same way we left it. It cannot be business as usual. We have to build back better and do tourism differently. And our four parents did that with every phase. So I'll go back to the beginning, early tourism, and why that began. Now, of course, I'm going to have to leave a lot for the questions and answers, because I have 20 minutes, so I have to really get through this quite quickly. And what was the most interesting component of early tourism is that the first hoteliers in Barbados were black and mulatto former slaves, who were the mistresses of the plantation owners. And the first waitresses, waiters, cooks, etc., all the staff would have been slaves because we we're talking that this was in a uh, slave society of when it started back in the 1700s. Now, there were two reasons. When we look at tourism, if we say tourism is a, is a social, cultural, and economic phenomena which entails the movement of people outside of their usual environment for business, um, personal reasons, leisure, professional reasons, what was happening in Barbados back then was indeed tourism. Barbados itself was probably the most metropolitan and commercially important island in the British West Indies. As you know, it was a major um, trading port for sugar and rum and a, a huge slave entrepot. It was the first port of call for all ships coming into the British West Indies and a major transshipment point for those ships, which meant Barbados was one of the busiest port towns in the whole British West Indies at that time. So what that meant is hordes of people, scores of people would converge upon Bridgetown on a daily basis. And these people obviously needed somewhere to stay, this transient society. And the wonderful thing about tourism is tourism is never planned. If you look at tourism over these centuries, nobody ever plans for tourism. And maybe that's why we usually have a problem planning for it now. <laughs> tourism just happens. 
people just show up for whatever reason. It could be religious reasons. It could be the Grand Tour in Europe back in the 8th, 17th and 18th century in Barbados. They show up for whatever reason. And this time it was for business and for trade, etc. And then you find tourism just happens, just constructs itself around this demand. Mm -hmm. So there's a demand for food and board, a demand for shopping, for transportation, for entertainment services, for social services. And those were provided. And what ensued then was a de facto fledgling hospitality slash tourism industry. This industry was run Zaytori by black and mulatto women. The hotel district was right down in Bridgetown, opposite St. Mary's Church in that particular area. And um, I could go into that and talk about that for hours, but I'll leave that there for now and just skirt over that early industry and how that started from a business perspective. But tourism also, and Sir Henry's gonna touch on this, so I don't really wanna steal his joy, <laughs> for health reasons. Um, that was a major reason and that, that laid the foundation for the tourism industry for the foreseeable future. Barbados had a reputation of being, I'm just gonna do a little bit, Sir Henry, and I'm gonna leave the rest of you, okay? <laughs> of having the finest climate and the healthiest environment of all the British West Indies. Um, I don't know if Sir Henry are gonna say this, our earliest famous tourist was a George Washington. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that to you. And um, because Barbados had this reputation for its salubrious climate, and it had the place to come for people with pulmonary diseases, diseases of the lung, like corona. Wink, wink, <laughs> right? People will come here, and, and even if they weren't on business, they used to come and enjoy the climatic conditions of Barbados that I will not touch on, because Sir Henry will, will, will do that. In addition to the health aspect, which formed the foundation of tourism going forward, and I'll touch on that as I, I get deeper into the industry. Barbados's reputation for being, for their genuine hospitality, for being a welcoming society. They said that Barbados was the safest, healthiest, and most socially agreeable island in the whole of the British West Indies. Barbadians were known for their obliging accommodation, their hosting capacity. Um, one person said of them that they were masters of the science of hospitality and graduates in the art of entertaining. They spoke loftily of them. You come to Barbados, they throw open their homes, dances, dinners, balls, sightseeing. They were, you know what I mean? They, people said that when you left Barbados, you probably left Barbados with, with most regret than any other island in the Caribbean. And um, even George Washington spoke loftily about the Barbadian hospitality in his um, diaries that he wrote back then. So this, reputation for genuine hospitality and friendliness is ironically what formed the very foundation of our tourism industry today. So not only were they coming for business purposes, they were coming for health reasons, but once they got here, what kept them here was the wonderful, wonderful friendliness and hospitality of the Barbadian people. And I'll go so far to say this, because I had read this and this didn't make it in the book. Even back then in slave societies, they were saying that even slaves, if they were out on the street and they saw a stranger, they would invite them back to the plantation in the name of their master and then they would be rewarded for their vigilance. So even from the slave perspective, they obviously were also conditioned to be very obliging, very accommodating, very friendly. And I believe this goes a long way towards explaining to this day, people come to Barbados. Why? Because of the Barbadian people. Why? Because they're so friendly and accommodating. And I think this is a generational thing that happened back then, and it, it, it has served us well up until present day. Well, those were just a few of the reasons why, but who were these early tourists, and where did they come from? Now, these early tourists were planters, businessmen who had interests and investments in Barbados. They were also civil servants, because Barbados was a, obviously the headquarters of, of the British army back then, so civil servants, naval officers. You also found that sometimes religious observers who came to observe slavery in action or the post-emancipation period. There were some professional sportsmen, but 
Travel then for leisure back then was a minority pursuit. You had to be extremely wealthy. So there were a few people who just traveled to Barbados for the enlightenment of the mind, for the sheer enjoyment of it. And they did come here, but they were a very small amount. And they were, of course, extremely wealthy people. They came from, ironically, the same markets that we have here today. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> the USA, <laughs> Britain, Europe, Canada. and later Canada. What is really interesting, we had a huge contingent from South America. And I'm very happy to see some of my counterparts in the BTMI here. <laughs> you see, this is why we need to know our history. Because when we go in and attack this new market, right? It was in the new market. There were so many South Americans coming to Barbados that in 1910, a member of the Legislative Council recommended on the floor of Parliament that there were so many South Americans in Barbados that they should really um, start to advertise Barbados in these countries. And we were talking Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, um, and Brazil. The Brazilians were the biggest contingent and they were liberal spenders, they were very wealthy. There were so many Brazilians in Barbados that hotels in Bridgetown in the late 1800s used to advertise that they served Portuguese food and that they spoke, spoke Portuguese. Mm -hmm. There were so many Brazilians in this country. There were Brazilian flags flying in Bridgetown. Mm -hmm. So everybody loved them because they were liberal spenders. The Brazilians, there were so many of them that used to stay in the Worthing, in the guest houses in Worthing. And they used to call that area the Brazilian village or the Spanish Quarter. So Henry? And Venezuela. And Venezuela as well. All of Worthing. All Worthing. Worthing, Hastings, that St. Lawrence in the Bath Hotel, which was run by a Portuguese resident in Barbados, Mr. Nunes Caesar. He also spoke Portuguese and Spanish, served Portuguese food. And the South Americans used to stay in the St. Lawrence Gap area because of that. So the South Americans were here. The Brazilians were here. And it could go way back with the Sephardic Jews who bought sugar technology here and the sugar revolution. But we'll just stick with the, um, the tourists that used to come. And as I said, were much beloved because they spent copious amounts of money while here in Barbados. And we also had the domestic market that appeared once the railway station um, was, invented, was implemented in Barbados in 1881. Um, and there was no easy, accessible, cheap, and fast transportation to the East Coast, which, by the way, was the mecca of tourism back then. Bathsheba was the mecca of tourism. The West Coast, during that time, was nothing more than a mosquito-infested swamp, not fit Sorry. for hotel development. Right? <laughs> That's right. I'll pack that a little bit. So. <laughs> It was the South Coast and the East Coast, because we said it was health tourism, so it was the bracing trade winds, the healthy ozone and the medicinal property of the trade winds. So South Coast, East Coast. And there were several, seven main hotels back then. There was the Sea View, the Marine Hotel. And when poor Mr. George Pomeroy built that and extended it 15,000 pounds in 1887, the Barbadians thought he was nothing short of a madman, that he would be so crazy to, to, to undertake an initiative as risky and as daring as building a hotel of that magnitude in a traditional sugar society. And it was over 100 rooms. How many rooms is it again, Sir Henry? 120. 120, right? 120 rooms. And um, a modern facility. Nothing has ever been seen in Barbados. But we had the Sea View, the Marine in Hastings. Then we had the Bath and the St. Lawrence in the St. Lawrence area. Then we had Crane in the Crane, of course. And then we had the Beachmont and the Atlantis in Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed a little bit to admit that those hotels, it was a hotel boom in the 1880s. And this happened because what was happening in Barbados at that time was sugar lost its preferential treatment on the um, British market and it lost its value. And um, the sugar industry went into crisis um, from the beetroot competition in Europe. Um, a lot of properties went into chancery and bankruptcy and 
the estate lands lost their value and sugar earners plunged. The country was plunged into a, a, a real severe depression. And um, so what happened at that time is as there were few forward thinking entrepreneurs who realized that or saw tourism as a viable economic option. And they started to invest in the industry. And this is what happened in the 1880s. That's why there was a hotel boom. So you found at that time, the face of tourism changed from black or mulatto women to entrepreneurial members of the white ruling class. And they were the ones they know who were the proprietors and the owners and the managers of the early hotels. So it was that shift. So the first paradigm shift of tour from a agricultural economy to a services economy took place in the 1880s in Barbados, the late 1800s. So those seven hotels, even though they came about in the 1880s, 20, 30 years later, when we were looking at the advertisement of tourism in Barbados, it was those same seven hotels that were advertised. There was no real increase in hotel stock. We had some bay houses and some guest houses on the island. And a large part of this, and one of the major problems of tourism, was that the colonial government had no interest whatsoever in developing the industry. Even though the industry was showing potential, great potential, at that time, people were coming. Um, you know, Barbados testimonials were being written by people who would come here and be healed by the bracing trade winds. So ignored and unplanned and unsupported, the tourism industry rose like a phoenix from the ashes of the ailing sugar industry to become the most viable economic option in Barbados in the late 1800s. Now, the reason why the colonial government had no interest whatsoever in developing an industry that was showing such huge potential. And I will, I will crunch some numbers with you in a couple of minutes. So wedded were they to saving the ailing tourism industry. Because Barbados was a hyper-conservative society. Sugar so, so industry, sorry. Thank you. You're listening. <laughs> I was wondering. I said that on purpose. <laughs> that was a test. You passed it. <laughs> so wedded were they to, to the sugar industry. Because let's face it. The legislature, I always have problems saying that word, was made up of the plantocracy and the elite and the upper crust in Barbados. So they were very vested in ensuring that tourism and that sugar was resurrected, the sugar industry. So even though tourism was humming and a coming and really developing quite nicely, and a lot of tourism revenues were going into the government coffers, they were not interested in saving, um, in further development of the industry. I can just give you a little story here. Something that happened in 1905, and I'll then juxtapose it what was happening in other islands. So Gilbert Carter, he was the governor in Barbados. He came in 1904, and at the opening of the legislature, a parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with the wine. But it, no, it's not. <laughs> See, the glass is still very full. Um, the open of parliament in um, 1905, in his inaugural speech, which was later called the hotel speech, this forward-thinking, worldly man prophesied the doom of the tourism industry. And he you know, said he turned the, tourism the sugar industry, prophesied the doom of the sugar industry, and recommended that Barbados had all the right ingredients for tourism, and they should invest in first-class hotels um, to the standard that wealthy visitors were accustomed to when they traveled, because they didn't have any in Barbados. The Marine was the closest, but remember the Marine was since 1885. This is now like, Marine is probably 25 years old. It's time for some fresh product. Um, <laughs> so he recommended that. He also said that countries such as Bahamas, Jamaica, um, the Bermuda, they had invested in first-class hotels. They had you know, created policy in terms of developing the tourism sector. And Barbados would be best served because it's a wonderful climate if it also went that route as well. 
Um, and he just pretty much was very pessimistic about the viability of sugar into the future. And he was like, no, we, tourism is the way to go. Look, poor man. When the elected members of parliament would finish with him, one by one they got up and skewered the gentleman. They told him how offended they were. How dare he say that the sugar industry was in systematic decline and pretty much you know, recommitting themselves to the salvation of the, the, the sugar industry. The matter was laid to rest. There were many, many, many attempts to, for government, a lot of proposals and plans were drawn up for government to invest in the tourism industry. These things were always shells. There were you know, proposals for them to build new hotels, an up-to-date theater, um, electric cars on the streets, um, a tourist bureau. This is all back in 1905. Nothing ever happened. Um, attempts for the private sector to secure funds from government to build hotels and to further develop the industry also was met with no support whatsoever. And um, the, the real nail in the coffin came in 1908, and this is the last part of the thing. I just wanted to, to set the scene in terms of the complete lack of government mental support from the public sector back then. Um, Lord Basil Blackwood, in 1908, he was the colonial secretary and the acting governor. And he, in his uh, report on the revenues for Barbados for 1908, pretty much said, you know, it really don't make no sense even trying to develop this tourism sector. There are no hotels here. Where, where are they coming for? Furthermore, Barbados is small, and I ain't got nothing to, to do. <laughs> so, yeah, you know what I mean? So nobody will come here for a protracted time. You could drive around the island in a couple hours. It just don't make sense. There's the acting governor here. Mm. He then went on to say that, yes, they understand that there is um, a need for another um, industry, a secondary industry, and an alternate forms of, of creating revenue. But tourism, um, sugar, is pretty much here to stay. There is no other industry that is as important as sugar, and there's no other industry that will serve the needs, the economic and the social needs of, um, of the people of Barbados, like the sugar industry. He made passing reference to the hotel speech, and he just laid it to rest. <laughs> so that was, they were not having it with this tourism thing. In the meantime, they were earning 100,000 pounds in 1908, 170,000 pounds from tourism and the, the trade statistics of, of Barbados in 1911. The colonial secretary said that same year that a lot of the prosperity that the island was experiencing was due to the visitors coming to the island, but they did not see it fit to reinvest some of that money back into the industry. Somebody said that foreign exchange was used to buy machinery for the sugar industry, for the machines that made sugar. So I believe that. But, um, so what happened was, and this is what I'm getting to, it, governments in, as I said, in Jamaica um, and Bermuda and Bahamas, in the Bahamas they passed the Hotel and Steamship Service Act, which was to stimulate the industry in 1998. And I think that's why Sir Gilbert pushed that, because he was a governor in, 19, in 1898. 18. So he would have come from Bahamas and saw the development and... In, 1980, in 1880, in 1890, in Jamaica, it was the Jamaica Hotels Act. And that was also working tremendously. Jamaica's, the government there built five modern hotels. And you know what I mean? They gave subsidies and government thing to the private sector. They negotiated contracts with steamships for steamships connection. The government funded hotels. There was a lot of foreign investment, exactly. So that was what was happening in those other islands. In Barbados, nothing. The government wasn't interested. Nothing happened there. So what was left to happen? The private sector stepped in. And tourism became a private sector-led endeavor back in those days. And um, the private sector, they're the ones that came up with the hotels, um, even though, as I said, no modern hotels were built in Barbados other than the Marine in, in, in 1887, all up in um, 1905, up to World War I, nothing, it was still those seven hotels. So Barbados had a problem with hotel stock because most of the, other than the marina at 120, most of the other hotels were 10 to 20 rooms. Mm -hmm. And there were only a couple of them and then some little guest houses or bay houses. And um, 
the private sector then, the first real foray was in 1911, the Barbados Improvement Association, which was a group of 22 concerned citizens who got together and decided we were gonna market Barbados as a winter resort. And we were going to, um, you know, make arrangements for visitors when they came to make sure of their comfort when they're here. They were gonna uh, develop facilities on the island, et cetera. They bought the, um, the engineer's pier, which is there at Radisson, that mm -hmm. pier that goes out. And they created the bathing pavilions, a bar and a restaurant. So they actually invested in tourism product and developed tourism product on the island. And in 1913, they did the Tourist Guide of Barbados, which was uh, a little brochure that they then um, distributed in several markets because they had representatives in Canada, England, and the USA. So they started to organize, the first real organization of the industry was a private sector-led endeavor. I'm gonna to have to ask you to stop there. Okay. Do not lose your thought, because in fairness, I'm going to have to go across to Professor okay. Emeritus, Sir Henry Fraser, okay. to ask him to give his opening remarks. Um, well, that's what they were. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, okay. And we'll come back to you. I have a, a series of questions that I have here. I, don't, I hope they're none from the audience, because I have a series of questions that I have here for you. Well, Rene, oh, you are going to be a very unpopular host because everyone would have liked Kerry. It's to called just building continue. suspense. She is just so fantastic. It's true. You know, we don't want her to stop. We <laughs> we just want her to keep going. Well, <laughs> I want to begin by saying that this book has been one of the most enjoyable partnerships of my entire life. My whole life is about partnerships and establishing partnerships, whether in medicine, history, tourism, or what. And working with Kerry on this was just amazing. Let me begin by saying thanks to Patricia Alfonso Das and to then Sue Springer, the then director of the BHDA, and the whole team, and, and particularly then to Sally Miller and Keith, who produced the book for us. As it was said earlier, I had the task of preceding Kerry's fantastic PhD thesis of nearly 400 pages to get it into something that we could accommodate <laughs> within a book and then expand and give the 20th century because all of those hundreds of pages which she had compiled in the process of a three or four year PhD then had to be meshed with my, should I say, 40 years of, she had four years of hard work, I had 40 years of fun working with the Barbados National Trust in Heritage Tourism. And I first started to talk about heritage tourism after a 1981 trip, uh, a lecture bus stop tour across North America, Canada, and so on, and discovering how the Canadians in particular, with their limited uh, Western culture, not the indigenous culture, were so fond of everything that was 100 years old. And we were busy destroying things that were three and four hundred years old. So my, my career in heritage and heritage tourism began back in 1981-82. And it takes me back, really, because everything really is, is about history and the past. And I have to say that the view of what we're talking about today has been beautifully summarized. I'm a scientist, so I have to give you evidence by a, an institution called Grandview Research Company, Market Analysis Report of 2022. And I'm going to read it for you because they said the global heritage tourism market was valued at $557 billion US dollars in 2021. And it's increasing. It will expand at an annual growth rate of 4% from 2022 to 2030 driven by initiatives of governments in contrast with the refusal of early governments to promote tourism at all, and in contrast with the present, until now, disinterest in our governments promoting heritage tourism. Because Kerry and I have been passionately advocating it for 20 years together, and we are only just beginning to see the catalyst of BHDA moving this forward. And the point was made by these 
students, these researchers, that travellers are increasingly seeking out tangible and intangible cultures on their vacation. But it's not actually new, because as, as Kerry said, we've had 200 years of tourism, and it culminated in heritage tourism, and it goes back to the Elizabethan era, 500 years ago, when well-to-do English people sent their sons on the grand tour of Europe mm. to see what? The antiquities of Europe, the glories of the ruins of ancient Greece and Rome, and to learn all about what was happening in Venice, to learn about the culture of Europe and the antiquities thereof. So heritage tourism is as old as the hills. They traveled between Greece and Rome, between Persia and other places in the far and Middle East to see what they had to offer. Heritage tourism is two, 3,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And when I was a boy, which is not quite two, 3,000 years ago, <laughs> uh, just about not 70 it. years ago, <laughs> <laughs> Some 70 years ago, as a small boy, I grew up in that fabulous, beautiful parish of St. John. The Republic. My parents lived in a small house at Four Roads, the metropolis of the country. <laughs> now, my mother was the postmistress of the parish of St. John, and so she read the advocate voraciously, and she knew exactly, because she was a postmistress, when the ships were coming in and going out. So she read the notices that appeared in the newspaper telling her when the Golfito or whatever was coming into Barbados. And so she would say to us that there's a cruise ship in tomorrow. And we would go down as little children to the bottom of the gap, not the gap between mountains, but the bottom of the little road where we lived. We would go out to the main road always at precisely the time that we knew there would be a trail of Der's Garage, big black Chevrolet cars, taking tourists to St. John's Parish Church, on to Coddington College, and lunch at the Crane, and back to the ship. This was heritage tourism. This was tourism 70 years ago. They got off the ship, they got into a Dersgrash taxi, they visited St. John's Parish Church, the ancient Gothic church, that is where my soul is going to be buried, and, <laughs> and Coddington College, and then lunch at the 1887 Hotel at the Crane. Heritage tourism is what kept Barbadians going alongside health tourism. So there are two H's here. I like these things. H for heritage, H for health. It's, it's very important. Kerry mentioned George Washington, the first visitor for health. Many others came for their health. One of my favorite people was the most, one of the most famous artists in North America. Uh, J.E.H. MacDonald. He came down here for a few weeks after a stroke to recover his strength, and he stayed at Bathsheba. He stayed at the Beachmount Hotel, and he ended up staying for three months. And he, a book was written about it. And he painted Barbados. He had wonderful paintings of Bathsheba that are exhibited in the, in the Toronto Art Gallery. And there are many others. Oliver Messel came from Britain in the early 1960s, and Oliver Messel made Barbados famous among many people in Britain and was largely responsible for the wealthy Brits who came and built villas all along the west coast and the hills of Westmoreland. So health brought these people into Barbados. And in those days, we used to advertise health in the era that Kerry talked about, the early 20th century, right through until the Second World War, Health was a part of the advertising, but in the Second World War, things changed. And she said, tourism stopped. And after the Second World War, all that then happened was the promotion of the beach and the bikini. Now, people don't really know the story of the bikini. Uh, uh, Two-piece swimsuits came in just before the Second World War. But after the war, there was serious economic problems. So couldn't, people couldn't build Sorry, people couldn't make a two-piece swimsuit that was large. They had to reduce the amount of material that went into it <laughs> as aggressively as they possibly could, you see. And so the, there was a Frenchman called Louis Rayard in 1946 who invented the bikini. And why was it called the bikini? Because in the war days, there was a Pacific island called the bikini, called bikini, which was where explosions 
were carried out. This is where the testing of the bombs the went on, bomb. you see. And so Riyadh said, I need a name for this modern swimsuit that is going to be explosive. And so he named it the bikini and it exploded on the world. And so again, the two Bs go together, beaches and bikini. And so when Barbados invented tourism, in the modern era, in the post-Second World War era, and they started promoting tourism, what did they promote? They promoted the beaches, and with the beaches went the bikini. They forgot their history, okay? And although my friend and mentor, Paul Foster of the National Trust and travel agent, Paul Foster, tried his best to bring the heritage back into it, it was too late. The hotels stopped advertising the health matters. They only advertised their rum punch, their cocktails, their beaches, and their bikinis. And that, that is really rather sad, because in the old days, the hotels all said, Barbados is a healthy place. We have wonderful, wonderfully tasting water. We have no sewage problems. We have great trade winds. The sea is wonderful. The temperature is fantastic. You know, if you go to the Mediterranean in the summer, the sea is just as cold as it is in the North Sea. It is freezing cold. We West Indians can't swim in the Mediterranean. You know, the temperature difference is about, I think, about 10 degrees. And we have stopped advertising Barbados as a health spa. But this is what it was. And it was advertised as a health spa for decades. And really, it is very sad that that has happened. But let's look at some of the facts about heritage tourism, why health is important and heritage is important. It has been shown by many studies that visitors traveling for heritage reasons spend about 50% more than other tourists. Did you know that? They spend about 50% more. They spend between 20 and 40% more time in the place that they're visiting than the average visitor. And this is quite amazing. In Scotland, 50% of the visitors to Scotland are visiting for reasons of heritage. And we are ignoring these important facts at our peril. And they've been well established now because this subject has been debated, and anyone can find this on the web. This has been widely studied, widely publicized for about 20 years. It is so important, the economic advantages of heritage tourism. And it's so important that I want to quote Kerry in something that she said in a recent lecture a few months ago. It's the next frontier of economic development oh, yeah. if we explore its challenges and see its potential. And yet for 20 years we've been preaching this, we're not priests, but we've been preaching this for 20 years and we are still not accepting its potential. And I think it's important, hugely important for us to do so. Let's say a little bit about the cultural heritage, the built heritage. These things are so important. At the Forumics Conference about six or seven years ago in Barbados, it was obvious how well some countries were promoting their tourism through their embassies and consuls. And we really do not do that. They were promoting their products through their embassies and their councils. And I made the point at the Forumics Conference that we do not do anything really to market our products. You cannot go to Paris without walking away with a trophy of the Eiffel Tower. You cannot go to New York without something of the Statue of Liberty. You know, I went to Florence and of course I came away with the Statue of David by Michelangelo. You know, these are the things that you need. We have, we have a world famous lighthouse, the South Point Lighthouse which has been abandoned as a site for storing huge piles of rocks by the Waterworks Department, by the Ministry of Transport and Works. It, the, I can't think of a country in which the most important single structure is treated as if it was a garbage can, the South Point Lighthouse. We ought to be ashamed it is the most obvious no-brainer for heritage de development. Every tourist in Christchurch at all those South Coast hotels, and Patricia will confirm this, I'm sure, they all see that lighthouse and they all go there. And we're doing nothing. We're ignoring the plans that we at the National Trust have put forward to government. I mean, it, it, 
upsets me a little bit. <laughs> the architecture of historic Bridgestone and its garrison. There are almost as many derelict buildings now as the, at the garrison as there are in good shape. They're mostly the smaller ones, admittedly. But government will do nothing about its promise to do something when we were nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site 11 years ago. We will lose that inscription, but it won't matter because we've never utilized it. The data suggests that sites, cities, or countries which are given UNESCO World Heritage status have between a 30 and a 40 percent increase in tourism visitation. And again, we've been preaching that, but it has not registered. I want to say a word, therefore, quickly about Glendary Prison, because Glendary Prison is an absolute no-brainer. There are well over 100 prison museums in the world. There are something like 40 in North America, 20-something in Britain, there are six in South Africa, including where Mandela was imprisoned. There are six or eight in Australia. We go on. People go to Alcatraz by the hundred every day. The prison in, Bel in Dublin, Kilmainham Jail in Dublin, receives 1,000 visitors a day, 360,000 a year, three times as many as our top St. Harrison Cave. We could have the most outstanding, interesting, fascinating, morbidly curious perhaps, visitor site in the Caribbean at Glendary Prison. And when it was open for tourism for one day, uh, the day that we organized a, a, a handing over of the keys, there were hundreds of people who went through. And I've been pestered by phone calls in the five years since then for people who would love to go in to see it. It's an absolute no-brainer, and it's sitting there at no cost to government. All they have to do is to long lease it to a private enterprise. Medical tourism, a world about that. It's very relevant to our history as a health spa. In Jamaica, you would go to a specific spa, traveling over rough, rough bumpy country roads for several hours to reach a spa with warm water. Barbados is entirely, all over the island, a spa with those magnificent breezes. And we have ignored the fact that it was a spa and considered a spa and would still be considered a spa with a perfect year-round temperature. The hurricanes always miss us and go elsewhere. Wonderful sea. Sea bathing is unbelievable. Occasional sargassum, yes. But medical tourism and wellness tourism, again, is a no-brainer. We've had two major proposals for state-of-the-art hospitals, both of which fell through for reasons that I'm not perhaps um, brave enough to mention here. But a state-of-the-art hospital in Barbados would be an unbelievable source of income coming in and saving income going out. There are, you know, tourism hospitals all over the world because there's something like 15 million people across the world travel for medical operations of different kinds. North America, the USA alone, spends 70 billion US dollars and it's growing at 4% a year across the world. Thailand receives 2.5 million. Singapore, 1 million. And in fact, it's been predicted by PricewaterhouseCoopers that 100 billion, 100 billion will be the budget of medical tourism in a couple of years' time. Wellness tourism, similarly, people simply coming for the benefits of the healthy environment. That is that is estimated at 800 billion a year. These are huge sums of money that we are ignoring. And if I mention that there are nine billion dollars sitting in the banks of Barbados, and there are no entrepreneurs in Barbados, but neither doctors, managers, accountants, or government willing to do anything about the huge resources that we have in our own banks to develop a source of income, as well as improving the health of Barbadians and the world and the Caribbean. These are obvious things. There's so many things that we can do to promote the optimization of our healthy environment 
and our opportunity as a country where the phones work, the water works, the lights work, uh, the, the port is safe, you know, the crime is the lowest in the entire Caribbean, and we're ignoring all these benefits and not doing the things that we ought to do because we are not thinking outside of a very, very tiny box. So, Madam Chair, I, it really I, is a no-brainer. I, I have questions for you. I don't know. Okay. I have questions well, for you. Well, let me just finish with, let me just finish with four no-brainers. Four no-brainers. We need to restore that UNESCO site. We need to restore all those derelict buildings because they can be put to good use at far lower cost, as we've shown over and over again, than building the equivalent building. We need to market our heritage. We do not market our heritage at all. We are the paradise with everything. We are the paradise with history. I could give you a dozen, a dozen little phrases for the tourism people to use since we wouldn't accept the ones that were suggested. I could give you a dozen. We are the tropical paradise with everything. Thirdly, we line? need to souvenir What's what we have because people don't know about it. And they need to take it away, even in the form of a postcard. And finally, we need, after all, we need to use this. Carrie and I worked hard on this. And this could be sold in all of our consulates and our embassies. We could sell a thousand in a few weeks if they were up there. And we could be giving these to all of our visitors, all of our people up there, to lure them down to Barbados and then increase our economy dramatically. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to kind of echo some of the sentiments. And Carrie, I'm coming back to you by one a minute. With Take your time. Uh, some of the sentiments I read online. Recently, I, I read one um, about, you know, People want to go back to the colonial past and why be wasting time with that and you know Barbados and this tourism thing because you know you want to talk about heritage but this heritage is taking us back to a dark place in our history. What would be and how would you frame a response? Because it's important that Barbadians have bite into this process. And all that you've said, while I agree with it, I think we have a disconnect between somehow the feelings of the people about our heritage. Mm -hmm and therefore promoting that as a part of our tourism product and the obvious value of that heritage. So how would you speak to those? I, I think there are two concerns? easy answers to that. Kerry may have several others, but I think there are two easy answers. One is to give the example of the pyramids of Giza or the pyramids all over Mexico and Central America. These are features of similar aristocratic societies where the vast numbers of people lived in sufferance and others, the, 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 the rulers, were living in great comfort. And those amazing structures are sources of enormous revenue. They haven't demolished them. They haven't ignored them. They haven't shut them out. No, they profit from them. So that's one thing. It's the reality of profiting from what you've got. The other aspect is that every single thing in the world has got good and bad sides. You know, you. You see a beautiful woman, but in fact, she may be very rude. <laughs> she may have a bad side to her. She may be very rude. Um, everything has got a good and a bad side. So our history has got good and it's got bad. As far as the buildings are concerned, some of these buildings are exceedingly beautiful and they can certainly be put to good use as most of them are all over the world. You know, the Tower of London was the most cruel place in history that one can think of, where you, you, only had to, you only had to be rude to the king and off with your neck. You went to the tower and that was your end of you. You were never seen again, you know. But the Tower of London has hundreds of thousands of visitors every month. So I can only say to you that we have good and bad in history. Nobody who asks you to come and see the cannons at the Hilton Hotel or to see uh, a Sunbury Plantation House or St. Nicholas Abbey or uh, St. John's Parish Church or any other beautiful ancient building is saying, we are celebrating slavery in these buildings. They're simply saying, this was the good side of the past. This is the beauty of the past. Let's accept it for what it is. When I started 
to write about history. I was often asked why I was concentrating so much on the chattel house. The chattel house was a symbol, if you like, of the poverty of the people who had been subjected to slavery and then to a second kind of serfdom almost after emancipation. And I said, but the chattel house is a unique, ingenious creation that represents a solution to multiple problems. And I then felt justified when my friend Ilombe Motley called me up one day and said, Henry, why aren't you at the National Trust doing something about the Chattel House? Well, I said, you know, I've been writing about it, I've been lecturing about it, and the National Trust had just bought one as a museum. So when we created the Chattel House Village at Tyrrell Court, it was not a celebration of poverty, it was a demonstration of history and of the most beautiful aspects of the ingenuity of people who were constrained to live with not a lot of money. So those are my two responses. Thank you. Dr. Hall? Yes. Because we've had this discussion. We have. You sure you want mine? I want, I want yours. Okay. I want, it is a, it's a discussion that I think happens and I think we need to lend context. Look, we had a discussion up to this morning. Yes. And you know my thought, I'm going to keep it real. When it comes to history, good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. I keep it real on all counts, mm -hmm. right? This thing to call tourism. I told Renee up to today, after I finished my PhD, and when I studied the evolution of tourism, the, 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 you know, the origins of tourism, and it, it originated within a slave society, because I went back into the 1700s. So I had to do an in-depth study as I searched for the word tourism like a needle in a haystack from way back then, because I went right back to first settlement and came down. I realized that um, I had to study the socioeconomic and cultural reality of Barbados at that time, and it was hard because I had to do in-depth study into the whole issue of tourism, of slavery, of, of, of the reality of life back then, et cetera, et cetera. And in order for me to achieve this part, I had to do the entire gamut. And when I looked at the whole issue of slavery, the fact that when we shifted that paradigm shift from the agricultural economy to services economy in the 1880s, the people who were the waiters, the waitresses, the cooks, et cetera, would have been, first and foremost, the first waiters, waitresses were slaves. The ones in that area would have been the descendants of, the sons, daughters, or grandsons, granddaughters of. And even out of necessity, they had to go from agriculture, working in the fields, to work in still being of servitude. The transition from an agricultural society or economy to a services economy has not been psychologically smooth, right? Just particularly within the context of a, of a legacy of slavery and colonialism. So we have to take all of that into context. We just can't ignore that fact and the psychological component of that. Even to this day, there's still discussions of service versus servitude. We still hear of issues with black people, maybe locals, African-Americans, Caribbean people, complaining that the level of service they get is different. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we whisper about over the fence, but we've never really took this issue on head on and dealt with it. And we need to have that discussion because it's the right thing to do, because it's lasted too long, and because when we look at tourism development and the direction tourism is going in, the tourists of the present and the future will still be what, yes, white, but increasingly they'll be becoming more yellow, black, and brown, right? As tourism and the people in Africa, in the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, India, get more disposable income and they're traveling more, right? And we need to start to get our people to start to think and become more aware, because I think, as I told you, it's generational, it's subliminal. And it, it, it is something, when we talk now about heritage tourism, particularly in an island where all vestiges of our African heritage have been wiped off the face of the earth for obvious reasons. We were taught in our curriculum everything British, and everything British was good. Africa was bad, so that had to go. 
But in reality, the Barbadian culture that has been developed over the centuries has been a hybrid of our British and our African cultures. There are things that we think are Barbadian or really have the historic Moreans in Africa, but we don't know that. So there are a lot of us who don't even want to know Africa or don't call me an African, even though we are. You understand? We, we didn't land here from a spaceship. We got here on a boat. Mm -hmm. You understand? So I think when we talk about heritage, and I think historically, when we speak about heritage, we've been talking about preserving the vestiges of our colonial heritage. And I think the majority of Barbadian have probably have a problem with that. We don't talk about preserving anything African, because there's hardly anything left. That's why I commend the professor speaking about the chattel house, because he and I have had this discussion, because mm -hmm. Sir Henry and I, we talk, we keep it real. Mm -hmm. And he, why I black, but we keep it real, right? <laughs> when we talk about these things, because in order to solve this issue, we have to get to the root cause. And because we do a very poor job of speaking and engaging the Barbadian people historically with anything, with tourism, with, with the whole issue of heritage and what they think, what they feel, involving them in the decision-making process, they are just outwardly rejecting this heritage thing because if heritage means Nelson or all the great houses or the windmills, et cetera, there is this outward. But I am one person who I don't believe in sanitizing or rewriting history. I believe it is what it is. You understand? The Jews don't <laughs> seek to forget the Holocaust happened. The Jewish people remind us every day it happened to make sure it would never happen again. I am somebody who says, put it out there. And it's only recently that, that plantations in America have started to bring the slave story into it. They never used to do it before. In Barbados, they never used to do it. I remember one time I called up at a particular plantation house that was giving running tours, because tourists were calling in to the BTPA complaining that they'd gone in this tour and it was all fluff and the planters ate off of this china and this staircase and this and the next, not to mention uh, the hewers of wood and drawers of water that was out in the fields that made this all happen. And when I called the place to ask, they said, well, we don't want to upset our guests from America. A lot of our guests are Americans and like British, we don't want to upset them. I said, well, it's the same people that call in here and complaining because they don't know the story before <laughs> they get to your place. So they're expecting that now. People are no. They want authenticity. Mm -hmm. They want realness. They don't want fluff. Well, Kerry, oh, can, I, can I ask you then yes. why, why I have had such resistance mm -hmm. to telling that story? When we, when we designed the Chattel House Village at Tyrrell Court, we built a slave hut that was a replica of the slave hut at St. Nicholas Plantation. Okay? I identified some almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago at least, I identified the building at the Grantley Adams Memorial School, which was obviously a slave hospital. And I have been working, writing letters, talking, telephoning, ministers of education for 15 years to get that slave hospital restored as an artifact of slavery. Because in Barbados, there's a UNESCO slave tour which only shows people signs. The signs of Sweet Bottom Village, yes. the sign of Newton Cemetery. But, so Henry, even if you're doing that in isolation, we need to be dealing with the story holistically. Yes. Right? As a nation and as a people. Right? Some but, people don't want to be reminded that they were African, they don't want anything about African. But the, the reason why they don't want anything about tourism either is the, the colonial underpinnings. Like what you said, in terms of colonialism and, and tourism is, is old school. We need to move on to something modern and technology. Yes. And they would, they would just throw away tourism tomorrow if they could. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people who understand the importance okay. of tourism, but yes. there's still this disconnect. And it's in many ways, it could be a kind of a head thing. And it has a lot to do with the fact that we have not ventilated these issues. Because by Enough. talking yes. about them, yes. there will be, that would open up people's mind. They would be understanding as opposed to sitting there and just coming up with, 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 with negative things in their minds and just saying, and the thing is about tourism, which I find funny, when if all is well and tourism is working, it's all good. Yes. But when <laughs> tourism is hit by a global crisis and stumbles, and the economy then stumbles behind it, it's heads off with tourism. And we can't have it both ways. So I want to ask you a question coming out of your presentation, Kerry. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about the colonial government having no interest in developing the industry you spoke about Sir Gilbert, I believe it was. Sir Gilbert Carter, yes. Who was 
who skewered in the legislature for his proposal for to daring, develop to, yes. tourism. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were so invested in the sugar industry that mm -hmm. there was no interest in tourism. Mm -hmm. Are we at that moment right now with tourism? Yes, we've exchanged one monocrop for another. But are we at the moment where we, the persons who are invested in this industry, are railing and saying there is no other option. No, don't bring me alternative energy. Don't bring me financial services. It has to be tourism because we are invested, but it's dying. Look, <laughs> there's a, that's a fantastic point. Mm -hmm. And there is probably a possibility. But you see, the thing with tourism, I will go back to a conversation I had with Peter Morgan back in the, um, before he died. I loved him dearly. We used to have a lot vibrant conversations about tourism. And I remember he told me back in the 1950s, and I have him on tape because I had one of the last conversations with him and I taped him. And that was for my PhD, but it, it, it was on the cutting room floor. And he had told me that when tourism was taken off in the 1950s, Sir Grant Lee Adams, he had a, a hesitation, he was conflicted because black people were being lynched in the USA back at that time. And to, be welcoming these same people into Barbados, knowing that local residents in Barbados would be the ones being of service. He was a bit conflicted, but when he looked around, there was nothing else that, other than tourism. And he went then with tourism. As I said, we, we, we exchanged sugar for tourism. I do believe that the, we should be diversifying the economy, but I don't believe it should be deaf to tourism to, to, for something else to happen. I think. Tourism is not stopping anybody from coming with an alternate economic um, uh, whatever, industry or whatever. I think that tourism, whatever tourism is, there's been a lot of investment in tourism. Anybody who wants, the fact that we have not done it after all these years is my question is, is it that we just can't get it done or there's nothing else that can be done? Hmm. I would like somebody to answer that because instead of cursing tourism, bring it then. Don't curse tourism, just bring the alternate, the alternate industry and let it run up next to tourism, I complement agree. tourism. We know tourism is a fickle industry, and when the global industry collapses, we collapse. So if it collapses, this sector will keep us afloat. Let's not be caught again with our pants around our ankles. You know what I mean? It's not if, it's when the next crisis is going to strike. This volatility is a, is a, is a part of the future. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, is don't necessarily call for tourism head. What we need to do is do tourism differently. We, listen, the, the seasonality model started in the early 20th century. In the interwar years is when I first saw winter rates and summer rates appear, right? Ironically, back then it was $2.75, <laughs> between $2.75 and $4 for winter, and $2.50 and $3.50 for summer, a day for room. And that was inclusive, that was, that was inclusive of service, um, early morning tea and fruit, breakfast, lunch, and a late dinner oh, wow. for, for, for $3.50 a day, yes. For two fifty a day um, during the, the winter. So depending that? on what property you stayed at, the marine was the most expensive at between three and six dollars a day. Anyway, what I'm saying is that's the first time I saw in my studies. Okay, this is where the industry now is starting to separate winter rates, summer rates. The seasonality came, and we indoctrinated the world because, like what Sir Henry said, in all of the promotional efforts, climatic conditions were used. Sunny Barbados. Uh, wintry, cold, foggy, rainy, horrible New York and London come to where the breezes are blowing, the invigorating breezes, the even temperature, the warm water. So the narrative played on in mind, just like we do today. So at sun, sea, and sun, and those climatic things, it was winter tourism. Come to Barbados for the winter season, winter season. There was no real attempt for year round, right? Then they broke it into two. That model for seasonality has lasted for over 100 years. Don't you think it's within our place now, even though we've tried to buffer those um, trough periods? But because now the visitor has changed, they're looking for more than a beach. Mm. They're looking for cultural heritage, they're looking for culinary experiences, health and wellness, community experiences, agro-tourism experiences. You go on, go on, go on, immersion in the communities. They want fresh local food. They want to give back. They want volunteerism activities. 
Those don't have to be between November and, and April. What you're looking for, those, type, those, those, don't, those they do not concern any type of climatic. You could do any of them in the rain. <laughs> you understand? So you don't have any more with this sand, sea, and sun. And only when I was reading it, I realized, oh my God, this is where it started. And it's been over 100 years. And we have so indoctrinated the world that the Caribbean is the place to come where it's cold up north and warm down south, that the world only ever really comes when it's cold up north and warm down south, coupled with the fact that we have done a pee poor job of developing the other sectors to show that we are more than a beach. We are rich in culture. The best food in the world, the best people. We were the pioneers of health and wellness tourism in the world. Back before there was anything called health and wellness. And now that health and wellness is the fastest growing niche in the world. It was before COVID, and it will be definitely still the fastest after COVID. We should be going to market saying we were the pioneers. Come to Barbados and telling our story to the world and standing head and shoulders above the pack and playing to our strengths. Don't play with ordinary, we done with the rest. We invented this, this thing called health and wellness, and the same climatic conditions that existed then still exist now. Of course, the water is must be a little bit more polluted in the air, got some more smog in it. I mean, it's not the 1700s before industrialization, but I still think we better than most. Them trade winds still come in across the ocean 3,000 miles, they can filter out, still be fresh when they get here. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, Barbados, cultural heritage, the early visitors, even though they came for health or they came for business, heritage tourism is what they did. They went around the island and looked at the architecture. They went to the plantations and looked to see how rum was made, how sugar was made. During the, the part of industrialization, they went to the gin cotton factories, the, the printeries, you know what I mean? And, 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 and the Bomanston to look at waterworks. When Barbados became more modernized and there were no telephones and electricity and, and water and everything else in Barbados, learning vacations like they're doing now. You know, a lot of, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Right. They're looking for the same exact things. We have been in this industry for over 200 years. We should be teaching the world, but teaching the world on our terms, right? So no longer can it just be the, a tourism industry that is, is, is a foreign entity run by foreigners for foreigners. It's now our industry and we need to take ownership of the industry. And we need to develop an industry that benefits all, that is 100% uncompromisingly Bajan, right? Because our authentic immersive industry where the Barbadian people are at the epicenter. And we could do it. And that's the way we're gonna change the mindset of the Barbadian people by opening that dialogue and letting them see themselves reflected in the Barbados stories of mirror in a way that is not happening now. So even though they understand it's important, they still feel the disconnect and it's deaf for tourism. Poor tourism. If Poor we do tourism. it differently, right? And we create pathways for our artists and our artisans and our people to, to, to showcase their supreme talent to the world. But first we gotta believe in Barbados. We first have to believe that Barbados is the best country in the world and our people are the most talented Professor Fraser, and there's nowhere else. Professor like a St. John woman. Uh -huh. Don't interrupt her. Absolutely. Please don't. I had two sips of I, I, wine, I want so to say, we have colleagues here from me. our tourism marketing, um, Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. I want to welcome oh, them. Bobby, sorry, I no, want to no, say, no. and I want to say <laughs> that when we talk about heritage tourism, I know that that has been a huge push for them. I know that Marsha, who's here with us, has been working really hard along with her colleagues on the board, like Ronnie Carrington, to try and sensitize Barbadians and visitors alike to the heritage of Barbados. I want to thank you for those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, persons like your, your former schoolmate, alumnus, um, Trevor Marshall, who does those fantastic tours yes. of Bridgetown, and other historians mm -hmm. who are really contributing to the heritage product. Correct. But I want to ask the question, because at the end of the day, we have these wonderful discussions. We leave and nothing changes, nothing happens. You've made some really great suggestions, but how do we really get this thing of heritage tourism owned, practiced, and implemented in a way that takes it forward meaningfully? I don't know the answer to that. Kerry's last words were changing the Barbadian behavior or something like that. Well, and we are mindset. fundamentally exceedingly them. conservative people. And I keep saying we have $9 billion in the bank and it's sitting there getting mildew or something. You know, why do we have $9 billion in the bank? Why are there no entrepreneurs anymore? In Barbados. But we're historically Why don't we do the obvious though. with it? We're historically Pardon? conservative, though. 
We like are the same so thing what I just said in terms of, of early tourism, if people you know, don't want to invest in so risky uh, a seasonal endeavor. We, we, just, we just are risk averse people and we, it's generational. Indeed. We are conservative. And that's why I began with the comment, I begin and end with the same thing. I began with the comment that the growth in heritage tourism at 4% per annum Heritage tourism is the fastest growing aspect of tourism globally, and the rate of 4% per annum is substantially driven, say these researchers, by the initiatives of governments to promote cultural heritage in the tourism industry. So why aren't our governments doing it? You ask me a question, I say, well, the biggest impact is when we have a dynamic leader who says, we're going to do this tomorrow, or rather yesterday, okay? And then it will happen, perhaps. So I can only say we have to get through. You're working together. You're working on the BHTA. You have contacts. We have networks. We have communication. This is on the web. Now this is going out. I would love to think that there are members of the government who are but, watching but what a, we're in suggesting. But in a economy, they're not going to... But, uh, we have derelict buildings all over. It's almost a, an abomination. Sometimes I'm very shame, because it, it almost speaks to us of a, a, a Philistine-like behavior where we could just let everything just rot right. and become bushy and, and just fall away. And sometimes when I pass and see it, I'm like, this is our history. Because like I said, I do not sanitize or I do not rewrite. It is what it is. By tearing it down, uh, letting it rot away does not mean it never happened, right? I am one who believes in telling the story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Leave it, and let's tell the story about it. By pushing it down and pretending it never existed does not remove the fact that it happened, right? So I think in terms of the funds that are required to, to, to renew some of these buildings, some people have done excellent jobs in adaptive reuse. They just probably feel we have to take that money and put it into something else, uh, you know, education or health or et cetera, uh, rather than spending hundreds of thousands of dollars but to the renew the our The economic own point, I'm going to interrupt because the economic aspect mm -hmm. is so much more important than other things in today's world. Yeah. And people do not appreciate that every historic building we have studied that has been restored has been restored at far less than building new. I don't think people are interested enough to even know those things. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, we first have to get to the point of whether, in terms of a plan, and I was speaking to Rene about this, what's the plan? And, and, and the thing is, the plan for, for, for restoring old buildings, et cetera, may it be of African heritage or uh, European or British heritage, the plan is, the, the fact that there is no plan as a nation, not just from a touristic perspective, from an island countrywide perspective in terms of, of, of a sustainable perspective, preserving our cultural patrimony and our history and our built heritage, because it comes down to that too, you know. This isn't just about tourism, this is about really us as a people. Mm -hmm. Is that important? Is that a priority for us? And if it is, what is the plan to put the necessary resources in place to prioritize what we're going to... Because the thing is, first of all, we were, I was saying, remember we had this discussion that it was like colonial buildings and people just didn't want to see us restore any buildings that f reminded us of the era of slavery. But then we had like Frank World's house, Samuel Absolutely. Jackman Preston's house. So it's not necessarily <laughs> the vestiges of, of colonialism. Yes. Everybody, some of our biggest local black heroes, places are currently rotting away as well. So it is just a as attitude towards anything old. It's, like, it, it's bigger than just the fact that we want to wipe our, well, our British a, heritage off the, the As I've often said, Bayesians always say, the paint, the paint peeling, the roof leaking, knock it down, is a standard response. The Chronic Disease Research Center houses 30 people doing amazing research. It's the star of the research entities of the University of the West Indies. And it was an abandoned house that the government had condemned. And I said, well, why is it condemned? Just because there are two shutters falling off and there's one leak in the roof? And I had it restored for a, a song. And it's the best research center now in the university. 
So, Professor Fraser, I think we are probably victims of the mashup and buyback culture. I don't know if many people in here remember that. It's that probably that. Piece of work. That's part of it. But the question then becomes, how do we move our people away from that? Because I have a concern. I mean, I drive around this country. I was two, we were in two years of COVID. Um, we didn't have many tourists coming, and mm -hmm. the place was still dirty. Nothing yes. to do with tourists. No. Um, yes. People still are not looking at... I remember growing up in a Barbados where at Christmas, at least, mm. Everybody would have their property pristine. Mm -hmm. Your new curtains went up. Immoral, we are no longer house proud. House. We're no, no longer anything proud. And we mm -hmm. can't blame that on tourists. No. So there's a wider discussion, I feel, that needs to be had. And maybe you can lend some historical bent to this, an historical perspective, as to how did we get here? How do we, is there a place where we can kind of pivot? I think I kind of touched on that in it, my big, long soliloquy there just now. But I, I, I do not know. I just think that I, I put it down to probably like cultural penetration and outside influences where we, what, like the, the, the values that we held there back then. And I think we were still lucky because I think I still got the tail end of it as a child mm -hmm. into an adult. Mm -hmm. I think anybody has come after yeah. because growing up, I still had, had, if you had a TV at all, black and white, you know what I mean? You still had to write letters, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You were isol insulated from the cruel world because there was no cable TV. It was just good old Channel 8. So that was the extent of the world. <laughs> Anything that was happening outside, it took a couple of months to get really? here. Really? Now everything is in real time. There's a, a, a BET and, and a different sort of a cultural penetration. You know what I mean? So I think we have changed and things and values we held there are no longer there. So whereas, like you said, I grew up my grandmother Christmas time, pole house getting pulled down, pulled she put down. in marl around the house. We had a pride there, you know, a pride in the industry. And that's where we got that in terms of the Barbadian motto. That didn't just occur by happenstance. And, and, and that came also back then with, and there's a story to that as well, back in the early 1900s, late 1800s with, with Barbadians and, and being the most industrious and proud they were so proud, even though they were here starving, working for 10 cents a day, they did not want to leave to go anywhere else. So proud of Barbados, they didn't want to leave. Starvation, everything else, they had eventually left. They went to Panama and they worked for a, a one US dollar a day. But even then, there was some, they were tied to Barbados. That pride and, and the hard work. Barbados have gone all over the world to work because we were known for being an industrious people. I, I think this, Microwave generation, this, this, this <laughs> me too, this me generation, everything that I'm seeing now, that the price of progress in some ways to me has been too high. It's been great in some ways, but in other ways. You know me, I went to DC yesterday and I stood up and watched some young girls not talking to each other, just pre -name. Full makeup. <laughs> At one point, I saw them like stooping down by the thing. I was like, what is she doing? But they had the phone on the ground. So they were like twerking, like so they, they could, the phone could capture. I was like, this, this is, this is, this is where is we it. are. This, this is, is the future. This is it. You understand it's, what I mean? So the outside influences, and we can't stop it because with every generation it happens. But I think technology now, and that's social media, and that stupid phone, and all them things, <laughs> that uh, there's, there's, the genie is out of the bottle with that. And I am nervous about what is yet to come. And when we lose those values that we held there that got us generation to generation, some of the greatest generations that were our parents mm -hmm. who grew up and were born into abject poverty but will die living in relative comfort and they made sure that their children lived a life that they couldn't, that to me was the greatest generation. And I'm talking about probably like Sir Henry's. generation. So Henry, like your generation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> a little, our a little parents, beyond. just kidding, our parents' generation. So, right. so generation, when, when yeah. I see the changes now, the, the, as I said, the, the, the struggle has been taken away. The struggle has been taken away. And whereas our parents probably thought taking it away was a good thing, we realize now that maybe, because I think a little struggle builds character and gives you that fight to, to, to try harder and to be more determined and to be better. When everything is handed on a platter, you, you don't appreciate it. You take it for granted. So, so I, all of that is to say, I, I just think that that is what the issue is, and I cannot tell you how we are going to pull it back. I don't know how. So I'm, I want to invite, because we have a number of persons here from the industry, to figure out or find out if there's anyone who has any questions for our panelists. Um, mm -hmm. I have one here that was submitted even before. So if you want to... 
do that for me while I do this. Okay. Um, someone who's asked, what does the future of tourism look like for Barbados? And you start to answer it kind of. But out of all of this, out of all of our discussion of where are we going? What does it look like? What does it look like or how would I like to see it look? Well, you tell me how you want to answer that question. Like the future I would like to has to be sustainability is the present and the future. There's no way around this, right? If there's anything left to be sustainable. Based on the climate crisis that is causing an existential threat to, to humanity, the tourism industry has to be the green leader. So we have to develop an industry based on the three pillars of sustainability, that's economy, society, and the environment, and take a balanced approach to ensure that we give each component equal focus. So it just can't be on the economy where we're looking at revenue and arrivals and, 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 and employment, et cetera. We now have to focus on the people to make sure that the people also are benefiting and are involved and included, and um, the environment to make sure that we preserve this planet, Mother Earth, for present and future generations. So tourism now, because as I keep saying, tourism is the goose that lays the golden egg, but it also has the capacity to foul its own nest, mm. if not properly planned, managed, developed, and most importantly, controlled. So we gotta control this industry. We just can't let the tourism tail wag the tourism dog and just go after unbridled um, growth and more and more and more tourists, you know I me mean? using up our scarce resources and not, you know, you know what I mean? We have to be more mindful now and vigilant. You know, are we gonna go after, we have to take a quality versus quantity approach. Where we look for a more high yield traveler, a more socially and environmentally conscious traveler who's gonna bring benefits to this nation and not just come and fly and flop and eat burgers and drink beer and get back on the plane and go away. They have to leave Barbados a better place than they found it. Luckily for us, that is the traveler of the present and the future, the millennials and the Gen Zs. And as I said, we have to control the industry. We have to realize tourism as an omnipotent force. Tourism could be a force for good or it could be a destructive force. We have to put measures in place to ensure it's a force for good, right? And channel the omnipotent power of tourism in the areas we want it to go and not just let tourism do whatever it feels like. Once we do that, we will create a phenomenal industry, one that is working for the people of this country. So like I said there recently, it can no longer be just Barbados tourism. It has to be tourism for Barbados. We gotta make tourism work for us. We just can't be blind working for tourism anymore. So we mean it has to be an industry that we eke out the benefits for this country, right? If there's one thing that's always bothered me, we have a lot of Barbados that are supremely talented. We have a lot of artisans, a lot of micro entrepreneurs, people who make in jewelry, who make in um, whatever, painting, fashion, you know what I mean? Our artists, um, our, our artisans. Yet we have tourists who are coming here and saying they don't want to buy souvenirs made in Taiwan, they want local. Because if it's just today, prefer to buy something mm, authentic, authentic and local. Correct. We did a survey when I was working at the BTPA, and that was the biggest issue. They said, you just can't find it. And I'm saying, how in Barbados have we not put measures in place to ensure we have pathways for the visitor directly to the Barbadian people so that they could get their fair share of the visitor economy, so that there's a fair and equitable distribution of the tourism dollar. And, and that's one way that the, the, the disconnect from tourism and maybe a little bit of resentment for the industry will come in if people realize this is an industry that benefits all. And these are things that can be put in place. These are measures that can be put in place. There are things that we could do if we really want to do it. Probably if we want really a diversify the economy, we could have by now, maybe, I don't know. Things like that, little things that will make a big difference to a broader cross-section of the Barbadian people. If we want tourism to work, we have to open up this industry and make it a lot more inclusive than it is right now. And I know my people out there doing real good things. I go to the farmer's market, I know quite a few people who are doing good things. And I know visitors knew these people existed, they will want what they are selling or making. Create those pathways. If there's one thing we could do, if it's just that, we would have done something wondrous, because we would open up the economy, and that multiplier effect through the economy would be wondrous indeed. That's just one thing. There's so much more, but I can shut up. <laughs> 
So we have a question. Mm -hmm. um, a lot been mentioning about tourism, how we can live with the way tourism and that sort of stuff. But I believe that um, first, we, with the school system, that is where we in Barbados have fell down. And we need to start there. Okay? Um, if you pick about four of the top schools in Barbados and you question them about Barbados history, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't feel that there are 10 out of each of those four schools, the, the, the children there would be able to tell you anything much about Barbados history because we've been fed a lot of the, the, the American history and, and, and the European. I'm not saying that those things shouldn't be mentioned, but we here in Barbados needs to know a lot more. Now, um, during the, 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 the um, slavery within the West Indies, Barbados being, being promoted as actually the, 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 the most educated, the, 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 the most um, richest within the, the Caribbean. Now, those slaves that came down here came to Barbados and they spread then through the, um, the, the, the West Indies. You know what I mean? All of these are things that need to be mentioned. Good? And if we keep them down there and don't let the, the, the school children know, I, I mean, like, who else would know? Because we, I mean, we were school children, all of us here, and I am sure that most of us in this room now would not be able to tell you much about the early history of Barbados. And uh, you, you know what I mean? How, how, how we were being um, spread out through, within the Caribbean from in Barbados. You know, you, you, you heard a lot about um, the, the Carinage, you know, where, where, where the slaves were brought here and, and spread from the Carinage throughout the Caribbean, you know? But ask them what those, um, how, how it was done. You know, we, 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 can't really, we can't really say it because those are things that we don't really know of. But there are people in Barbados who know of them, and we need to get hold of that history. We need to go into the schools, you know what I mean? And as a part of our curriculum, use it within the schools. This, this is the only way that we in Barbados will be able to do something as far as tourism, that rich tourism that we have that rich history that we have, mm -hmm. we would be able to, 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 to spread it. And unless something is being done, I believe um, we should be able to, to do a petition then, you know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm serious. Where we would be able to get this history spread. It's no sense we keeping it within our bosoms. It's no sense Henry, um, Sir Henry mentioning these things and nobody different than him you know, taking them up. You know, we, we have to be able to use people like um, Sir Henry, even um, your um, Dr. Hall. What, what, yeah. Huh? yeah, Kerry. Kerry, yes. yes. So, <laughs> that's a good time to promote my books. I, I, I was just able, thinking, did you know? We have to be able to use people like you and, 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 and Sir the Henry said. <laughs> in order to get this message out to people. Otherwise, we just would not be going anywhere. We would not be able to, to, to do anything about the um, tourism market that we have because it would just remain the same thing that we have in every year. Good? And we need to get down to the bottom of it and get it across to the people. So I, I think I will ask Professor Sir Henry Fraser to talk a little bit because I know for sure that he has some some books that deal with some of the concerns and <laughs> topics that you have raised. So I'll give him a moment to self-promote. Well, maybe, thank you, sir. Maybe this is a good moment for some marketing. Yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> I am not a historian by training. I'm a historian by instinct. And my historical bent was induced by Sir Alexander Hoyas, the great Barbadian historian who taught at the Lord School. And it was through his famous book, Our Common Heritage, that I grew up understanding all about our national heroes like 
like um, Charles, Dr. Charles Duncan O'Neill and Samuel Jackman Prescott. These were people that he taught us about at Lord School. And so Lord School boys were privileged to know more about our history in Barbados than any other schoolboy. So I have therefore in my alternative career as a historian tried to popularize history. And therefore this is a good opportunity, thank you sir, for marketing my book, The A to Z of Barbados Heritage by Carrington Fraser Ford et al. And for marketing my book, Did You Know? Because in my Did You Know, which comes from the radio series, Did You Know on Capital Radio 99.3, where we're you hear market that. vendor at 725. <laughs> we're not marketing that. And most people exactly. want to hear market vendor at 725. <laughs> and if you leave the radio on by accident, you'll hear me at 815, <laughs> giving you a bit of Barbadian history, which I call people, places, and untold stories of historic Barbados. So my, my, my view is that our history is crucial. If you don't know and understand history, you make the same mistakes. We need to know our history. Or a man who doesn't know his so, history is like a tree without roots. Absolutely. And that's what it is. Yes. You, you, so, something is missing. There's a missing link. You can't yes. connect with yourself. Yes. You don't know who you are. That's right. And you're so, flip flopping like a, sh a, a, a fish on a deck. So I wasn't there at the microfilm like Kerry for day after day oh, after God. day. Okay. I've basically been regurgitating what people like Kerry have researched and trying to popularize it, getting out there, get Barbadians to understand why Winter Crawford I talked about today, why Winter Crawford was a great man and he used his pen, mightier than the sword, to get his democratic principles across to benefit the population of Barbados. So I, I really enjoyed writing about Winter Crawford you know, because he was one of those wonderful people who promoted the well-being and development of the country. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, excellent did, did you, um, did you contribution. Did you mention the name of the books once again? Uh, did you know? <laughs> did you know? <laughs> and the radio program, Did You Know, on Capital Radio 99.3 on the FM Not that dial. Part. Not that part. It's what <laughs> I call the young people's radio. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of my a lot of my contemporaries say, but why can't they play good music? <laughs> so this book, and I, I, since we're doing marketing and promotion, I really want to make persons who are watching and who are here aware of this book, Island in the Sun. Um, I only came into possession of this of a copy. I no, I when when it was launched, I was around. I got it. Patricia, don't look so mortified. But <laughs> I only mortified. came into possession of a copy of this book of my own because we had one at the Intimate Hotels. Um, a copy of this book of my own um, recently, and it is a wonderful book. So I would encourage you, if you do not have a copy, we're hoping to digitize this book to share across the school system and certainly outside of Barbados for persons who are interested in the history of, of tourism and in the BHTA. And as we celebrate our 70th year, I think it's particularly important that we do this retrospective. And Carrie, you, you stopped kind of around 1918. You didn't talk about the post-World War phase, but one of the concerns you know that I've shared with you mm. is that tourism and tourism practitioners and tourism policy makers and tourism leaders act like everything we do is the first time it's ever been done. Mm. And there's so many things that historically we could learn from in terms of tourism. So I want to, I want to ask you if there are any kind of top or key lessons that you think we need to take forward from, for this industry in order to help us to build it stronger as we emerge from COVID. As we emerge from COVID, I mean, I, I, I will just speak generally. I mean, there are certain things, lessons to be learned. As I said, the more things change, the more they remain the same. The same way early visitors valued our Barbadian early hotels were known for three things, and that's why they were so popular. Um, personalized service, great food, and clean and comfortable accommodations. Great food and drink. And drink, <laughs> right? And if you fast forward to present time, those are probably still the top three. Mm. Personalization is a major trend in the, in the industry right mm -hmm. now, where people want you to remember their name, mm -hmm. remember what they like, remember their behaviors, and, and tailor your, your service offerings to them based on, on, on those preferences. And that's the way you retain your customers, build loyalty, and increase profitability. All right? So that is something that has not changed to this day. And I have my colleagues here from Beta. Um, which is the shared economy sector, who are here nodding in there the There you go, especially the shared they economy. They talk to us at that. all the time They're about that. that. Yes. yes, that personalization. And, and, and what happened then is that these small hotels were like sole proprietorship. So 
the, the owner was the one there ensuring it could have been Mr. Cezanne um, Nunez, um, Emily McConney down at Bathsheba, Mr. George Pomeroy at the Marine. You, they were the people you could connected or contacted to make arrangements, and they were the ones to take care of you from beginning to end, mm -hmm. right? And provided the, the most excellent service. So that is why Barbadian's um, hotels were so um, sought after back then even though you would have to travel a little farther from Bahamas or Bermuda or Jamaica to get here, people bypass Jamaica, et cetera, to come to Barbados. And also because Barbadian hotels were a lot cheaper than the ones in Jamaica. Believe that? Mm. We, were one, we were amongst <laughs> some of the most affordable um, back then, right? Um, issues of, as I said, seasonality, et cetera, things that happened over 100 years ago. I think we need to start to look at and ask ourselves, is this still relevant within a 21st century context? And what can we do to bring tourism into the 21st century? Don't just ride off of a model that existed 100 years ago or 200 years ago because of what was happening back then. It suited them to do this. In the 21st century, does that suit us? I need to think we, we need to stop just by rote running this industry and stop and take stock and really take true ownership of this industry and create an industry in, in our own image and a reflection of the Barbadian people, the Caribbean people, um, and one that is, is a modern 21st century, uh, a relevant industry, things like that. Um, back then, the importance of tourism infrastructure, because Barbados tourism really accelerated in leaps and bounds as Barbados became modernized. And I'm talking about the accessibility to communication, transportation, um, utilities. Barbados was interesting because it was a curious mixture of the modern and the antiquated. On one hand, Barbados had pipe water from 1861, because remember in 1864, 20,000 people died from a cholera epidemic. And that's a waterborne disease. So by 1857, they started to get the pipe water in place. 1861, the first pipe was open on um, Sir Nelson's statue. And then by First World War, the entire island had pipe water. That was huge back then. Because one of the things about Barbados is health, and we marketed the health. There was this feeling in the region back then that there was something called miasma, or miasmata, called bad air, mm -hmm. caused yellow fever and malaria. That's where malaria comes from, bad air. It's Italian for bad air. They thought that this bad air came from the noxious fumes emanating from fermenting organic matter, from the luxuriant vegetation and the warm climate. So they thought that the leaves and, and the thing and marshlands, the fumes that they released, you inhaled it, and that's how you got malaria. Mm -hmm. And for centuries they thought that. That was so erroneous, because it was really the mosquito, right? That was giving you, not a mad ear, not malaria, <laughs> right? And that, they didn't realize this until the 1880s. So then they realized all of the casts and the drums that they were storing water in, because it was not pipe water, were breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And I'm sure Professor could probably correct, because this is his area of, of, of medical expertise. And only when they had pipe water and they didn't necessarily need the drums, et cetera, anymore, that went a long way to, towards Barbados really becoming healthy. Because even though we market ourselves as a health resort, Barbados still had a reputation on the Caribbean of being the cradle of fevers and the graveyard of, of the white man. So Barbados still had, in a lot of its promotions in the 1920s and 30s, a lot of its promotions went, took great pains to talk about pipe water, sanitation, even the crane and the, in the, and, the, um, and the marine. They made it a great point to talk about the cooking and drinking water was filtered. We have a drainage system. We have sanitation for people to know the water is healthy. And that was a competitive advantage because there's still some places in the world, you still have visitors coming to Barbados today to say one of the reasons why they come yes, is because of the drink drinking water. water. It's true. Right? So even back then, that was, uh, the crane marketed itself as, if you came to the crane, you restored health without the aid of medicine, right? Because of the water and the trade winds and everything else. So in the marketing, 
they made a great point to talk about sanitation, pipe water. Um, in the 1930s, tourist guide, they talked about the fact that you know, we don't really have hurricanes. The last hurricane was in 1898, and the one before that was 67 years before that. So, you know, the hurricanes and the scientists are saying that the hurricanes are going on a more northwesterly track. This is in 1913 now. Fast forward to today, right? So they were still taking great pains to, to shake off this reputation that the region had for death and destruction, even Barbados. If you go to the Caribbean, you will die. Early voyages, people would show up to see people off on the ship, and it would be like a wake at a funeral. They'd be weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth, because they know we certainly ain't seeing you again if you're going to the Caribbean, right? That is certain death. And um, so that's why Barbados took such great pains. Even though it had a reputation for health, it had its corresponding reputation as well for, like I said, cholera kill. 20,000 people in 1854. So the pipe water, we had telephones from 1882, six years after the telephone was invented and three years after it was introduced into Paris and London. We had cars. By 1908, there were 24 cars. By 1912, there were 250 cars in Barbados. And that was shortly after the cars were invented. Mm -hmm. So as I said, Barbados was very modern and antiquated. We had a railway train, the first country People used to come and see this train in Barbados and was like, oh my God, this place is sophisticated. I in London. And we had a very good reputation, an elevated symbol, an exalted symbol of our sophistication was the railway. We had the first and the largest horse-drawn tramway system in Barbados. But the bugbear with Barbados was, although it had all of these things, water and telephone, railway station and cars and everything else, we did not get electricity to 1911. So people used to laugh at Barbados because Jamaica and Trinidad had electricity from back in like the 1860s. They had electric trams and the place used to be lit up. So Barbados at night, you'd be driving on the railway train, the modern train, and you'd be going to sit in our darkness once nightfall fell in Barbados. Six, so you still had to light Barbados by gas. And as I said, we did not have electricity. So only when we then got electricity in 1911, we were then able to, it took the tourism industry to the next level. Because hotels now could promote that it had refrigeration, mm -hmm. electricity, ceiling um, fans. They had um, pipe water. They had, you could call now, make reservations. You know what I mean? At hotels. And this then took the industry to the next level, the next level of modernization. And, um, the steam ship, the steam engine that was invented during industrialization, the steam ship then took tourism to the next level and revolutionized the industry. Because people can now travel. Before, by sail ship, it used to take six to nine weeks. The conditions were unsanitary, uncomfortable. It was a very dangerous trip, a very long trip. The steam ship now, you could get there in 10 days. It was fast, was cheaper, more reliable, more hygienic, and it took on a therapeutic dimension. And then these cruise tours started to the region, itineraries and packages, and that is what started the real tourism in Barbados and, and the, the region, when the cruise ship industry took off for leisure travel back then. And it was peaking when the First World War started, and that cut it short, and everything this just died a natural death there until the interwar years. So there are things like that, like things that happen. So what I'm saying is it shows once you have the right infrastructure in place, like what happened back then and what we need to do now, put the whatever is required for tourism um, to work, whatever infrastructure is needed to take the industry to the next level. And I must admit back then, the government really didn't do it. A lot of this was private sector or external companies or who put these measures in place. Um, the government did not really get involved, as I said, until spending 60 pounds or 100 pounds a year and when the Barbados Publicity Committee was formed in 1932. And that was the first joint venture between the private sector and the government. Private sector played the subsidies, the government gave a grant, and that was the forerunner to the Barbados Tourist Board. That's yeah. when tourism really took off then in the 50s. But up to then, it was like the slow boat to China. But what I'm saying is in a post-COVID world, 
We just have to, and I told you this, what is the plan? A lot of countries spent the last two years in the engine room coming up with a plan for now. They're now executing their plan. I'm not sure if we did that, right? Because, and I'm not talking about another plan, because I wrote a plan, they got a master plan. I'm not talking about another shelf study. I'm talking about a plan that involves the private, public sector, civil society, CBOs, NGOs, and I mean community-based organizations, everybody, a comprehensive vision, an inspirational vision everybody could get behind, buy in, and agree to, so that it will actually work, and it's an actionable, implementable plan on the way forward. What do we want to see? For, we need to reset tourism, we need to reassess our priorities, and reevaluate the role we want tourism to play for us and for Barbados. But what is that? This is the time to do it, because we don't get it right now. Can you see that long and costly pause when the whole world stops simultaneously? That's unprecedented. That time should have been used wisely, right? Because typically, when things start moving again, when you got to stop to do that, and everybody gone ahead. Mm -hmm. When everybody was sitting mm -hmm. stationary, we should have really come up with, this is what we see. Are we going the route of cultural heritage tourism? Are we going <laughs> culinary? Are we going to go health and wellness? I think that's the best bet for Barbados because of our history and because of it will put us as a competitive advantage. And I just choose two or three things. Don't do 10. Don't do 10 things badly. Do three things really well. And it, it has to be actionable and implementable, not another shelf study, something that we could actually get done. And I think that now is the time to revolutionize and reimagine our industry. And those are overworked words. But we really need, and it's only going to come if we can all agree. And I would like the Barbadian people to be included, because without them, this industry is going to shut down at some point, especially seeing the visitors are seeking immersion. They have to be involved. And they are involved organically, you know. Nobody waiting on us. It's true. Nobody it's waiting true. on us. The that tourists making true. friends with Beijing, Beijing getting involved. True. They're not waiting on us. It's happening as we speak. Thank God for that, because that's why the people keep coming back. But we need, we can do it better, and we can. And I think we need to have more strategic and effective collaboration. And if everybody's on the same page, instead of redundancies, we here doing the same thing, and they're doing the same thing, let's collaborate. Or let's agree so that, you know what I mean? We can't get things done unless we have the buy-in of, of the BHD and y'all need to be on board. Sustainability can't work unless the, the his hospitality sector buys in. Because y'all got to really lead it. A lot of what has to be done has to be led by the hospitality sector. So I will pull up here. But I'm saying it, 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 we need fresh thinking, and we need a more collaboration. We need to determine, is tourism it? Is it going to work? Are we going to do it differently? Instead of doing it the same way we've done it for the last 70 years or 100 years. And this is, to me, one of our real, not last chances, but phenomenal opportunities to get it right. And I hope we don't squander it. I really do. I'm a little concerned, though. So, <laughs> Professor Sir Henry Fraser. Yes, ma'am. What is your hope? What do you want to see? I know you talked about heritage, but we just talked about the, the kind of the top things that Kerry wants to see for tourism to take yeah. forward. Well, I'll just give you a few sound bites. One, I think we do need to have a nice little phrase that describes Barbados. And as I said before, Barbados is the paradise with everything. OK, I think that's a good one. A soundbite's important. <laughs> and I still think we are the paradise with everything. Secondly, as Kerry said, we have a history of being a healthy place. And health tourism is an important dimension of our tourism. And we have huge sums of money around, and we have lots of clever people around. I know lots of our bright young people have emigrated. But there's no reason why our government shouldn't do what I quoted here, why our government shouldn't lead in some of these things, rather than simply saying, well, how do we rescue this situation by a tweak here and a tweak there? As Kerry's implied, a tweak here and a tweak there will not really resolve the problem and build our sustainability. Health tourism, to me, is a no-brainer. Secondly, we need to have our government come on board and say, look, history has good and it has bad. And there were things that were built maybe in 1700, 1800, 
1900, and a lot of our historic stuff that we have reused was built in 1940. But it's being allowed to fall apart because it's old and the paint is peeling. And so we need to bring a sense of economy and to recognize that our heritage is attractive to visitors. They don't want to just see a cheap, downscale version of Miami. That's not what they've come here for. You know, Great. the desecration of Spite Stone and now a bridge down is a tragedy. It's a terrible tragedy. And we're allowing our historic garrison, even though it was a military outpost of a different era, it is the most important historic garrison practically in the world. And it was one of the best preserved, even though 20% of it is now derelict. So we should save it, I think, because that's what people like to see. And right there in the garrison is our horse racing. And our Gold Cup used to be a very important sporting event for many people, for many people. And we've allowed that to be downgraded. But our garrison with its night racing and so on is something that should be attracting large numbers of people. It's something that should be promoted on our websites. So there's an awful lot to do that we need to do to modernize our marketing, make our marketing relevant, and make our product relevant to the change in tourist requirements. And I come back, therefore, to the two H's, heritage and health. They, to me, are the largest components that we need, apart from, as Kerry said, the underlying change in attitudes, behavior, and perceptions, and the involvement of government. And government needs to talk to people who have a little bit of knowledge, experience, insights, and ideas. Because most of the time, our governments come into government with a view and they are followed through rather along a narrow path without seeking the consultation from people like Kerry, who have a great deal of experience and knowledge. Thank you. Oh, I really, really want to thank you both. Um, when I, we had this chat at UE, and I thought about doing this, I'm, I wasn't sure if it was going to happen, because bringing the two of you together in itself is an accomplishment. I feel like I'm between <laughs> so much brain power um, but I really appreciate the time you spent with us. Rene, can I leave you with a quote? Certainly. One of my favorite books is a book about tourism in Barbados by a man called Raymond Savage, published in 1938. It was one of my father's favorite books. And he said, and I'm going to quote, he said, where in the world can someone who is tired and weak in health travel to find sun without undue heat? brilliant vegetation without the usual insects and reptiles, tropical beauty without fear of fever or nausea odors, all at moderate prices. And he said, I have discovered the nearest place to perfection that I am ever likely to find in this sad world. That outstanding jewel is the little island of Barbados. What more can you ask? And there are many more testimonials <laughs> along that, yes. that you know, yes. um, train. Along when you lines. read them and you think, wow, you mean the, the, the way, the high regard that Barbados was held in, in especially in terms of its healing properties. And, I, and I, think, I think we underplay the fact that we are still held in that high regard by many of our guests. Yes. yes. So I was going to ask for closing comments. Should I take that as yours? That's my closing comment. Thank you. I thank you. And um, Dr. Hall? Don't you think you've heard enough? <laughs> <laughs> we never tire of hearing you. Is there anything, any few last words you'd like to say to us, to leave with us? No, I just, I... Ladies first and ladies last. Uh, <laughs> I, um, the whole issue of tourism, I mean, I, I have studied, I've worked in tourism my whole life, I've studied it. As I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm always very honest about this industry. I understand how it developed, I understand. The, the past informs the, the present, and it gives me an insight into the future of this industry, because you have a helicopter view of it. I understand why people feel the way they feel. I understand the, 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 the historic moorings as to why 
why people feel this way and why, how this, these feelings have originated and how they impact something like, like tourism. Um, but at the same time, I, I truly enjoy the industry. I have, I've worked in it my whole life. And I do believe that there's a lot of potential for this industry. I am a proponent of, I keep saying, doing it differently though. And, and I, have, I don't have to repeat myself, I've talked about it the entire night. And I believe that if we can achieve this, this is not an industry that more or less, you know, we, there, there are some things that have been done that are not right, but I do not think you need to throw out the, the, ba the baby with the bath water. I think there's a lot of potential for tourism. I think if we particularly diversify this industry, and I agree with Sir Henry, you know, health and wellness, cultural heritage, our built, our natural, and our intangible culture, and I would throw in, you know, um, culinary under culture as well, and just pick three or four niche areas that help us to expand this industry, help us to create a more inclusive industry help us to create a year-round industry where we, we see more revenues coming in. I mean, when I last thing, Barbados is several million billion dollars in debt. Where we can get that money from? They're turning to tourism to do it. So as much as you're cussing tourism, everybody's still looking at tourism and expecting uh, we still need a couple billion dollars from you, right? And if we're going to do that, we have to find ways to double or triple the tourism economy. And the only way we're going to do that is if we diversify the tourism industry Yes, we still need to diversify the Barbadian economy, but I'm, I, because I'm here speaking to tourism, we need to diversify the tourism industry into these other lucrative, high-yielding niche areas, right? We have to find ways to attract the high-yield traveler. We're talking about quality versus quantity, so it's not about increasing more and more and more arrivals. It's about the quality of the traveler who will stay longer, spend more, who will, is more environmentally and socially conscious, and going back there again, who wants to support the local economy, who wants to give back. We have to be a lot more discerning in who we invite here because we have scarce resources in this country and tourism and tourists use up a lot of those resources in terms of our water, in terms of our energy and generation of copious amounts of food waste. So we need now to bring people who are more mindful. Thank God since um, COVID, all indications is that more tourists now want to travel more sustainably since they went through COVID. They want to stay at green accommodations. Mm -hmm. They believe that we need to do more to save the world. And people seem to be a lot more sustainably minded. And I hope it's just not coming out of COVID that there's this feel good thing and then we go back to our bad habits. But when we look at the news every day, that's enough to scare us straight. Because what are we saying on the news, right? There was a time when they thought that the melting ice caps or the rising sea levels was the problem of the Arctic or the little small island developing states. When you look now at the developed world, tourism is now on the front line and it's, it's, it's circling in closer and closer. So I hope that now it's reaching them and not just us, that they're gonna actually go and move and do something about it, about reducing that, that their carbon footprint and earning over that $100 million they pledge for us to, to have more resilient um, and greener economies. So all of these things, the type of tourists we are attracting, we have to be more mindful. I don't think we could just sit anymore, let, as I said, the tourism tail wag, the tourism dog. We have to more, be more strategic in the type of tourism we're gonna develop, the type of tourists we want to come here, making sure it's gonna work and we give them the experience they're looking for, but it also benefits Barbados and its people. Mm -hmm. We need to move to that. And that's why when I say doing tourism differently and building back better, all cliches I know, there is purpose behind what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is getting rid of tourism, no. I'm not a proponent of that. And I know they're in several quarters are calling for tourism's head. I'm saying do it differently do it better, do it more sustainably, do it more inclusively, we do it more innovatively, do it differently. And we would do it better, we could achieve the goals that would not only benefit tourism, but would benefit Barbados and its people. And I think the Barbadian people, it has to be an industry, as I said, of foreign by, and they have to be beneficiaries of it. Um, so I think we could achieve all those goals if we do it rightly, but it's gonna call for a plan, and a plan that all of us could get behind. I haven't seen that as yet. Let's get start working on it, like yesterday.
because time is against us. We're behind the eight ball right now. Time is against us. We need to get cracking. I completely agree. I think the BHTA is definitely at the forefront of that battle to ensure that tourism remains sustainable, that we have an industry that continues to contribute to the economy of Barbados and to the betterment of the Barbadian people generally. Um, we are predominantly locally owned industry, despite other persons having a different view. A lot of our investment in this industry is local. And we, from the small hotels through to our shared economy, right up to our large hotel partners, across our direct tourism services, attractions, restaurants, and all in between are committed to ensuring that tourism continues to do, as it has done in the past, um, to build, to contribute, and to develop the economy and the society of Barbados. And so thank you, Dr. Hall. You're quite welcome. And thank you, thank you. Professor all of you. Emeritus Sir Henry thank you. It has been a pleasure having you, and thank you all for being a part of our panel discussion this evening.